This packaging room used to be my machine room. This processing warehouse used to be my classroom. And this area on the other side of the wall used to be my workspace. My businesses have expanded to the point where I basically have no more room to work and my home garage is pretty full because it's, well, really small. But over the years, I have shot a bunch of footage for potential videos that were never finished or released. And at the end of each video, I'll tell you why it was never released in case you wanted to know. I'm Justin and this is the Lost Episode series from TFS. Okay, now, in order to get this part going here, we're gonna need to build ourselves a temporary fixture. That fixture is basically some scrap metal stuff that you know kind of puts the points in space here of what we need to work with. It's important to not get too carried away with your fixtures. This one is nothing more than a piece of 11 gauge cold roll scrap that I was next door at Weld Metals Online and marked up and cut down to size. Now, in the event that you don't have a shear or something like that or any scrap metal just laying around, you can always go on to weldmetalsonline.com type in your size of whatever sheet metal you want cut and have it delivered straight to your door. It's super easy. Now these bolts here, these are fancy grade eight bolts and we're just gonna use them as placeholders. Do we need grade eight bolts for a temporary fixture? No, I'm just being too lazy to go to the hardware store right now. So if we put these in place, set them up just like that, we can weld this thing out and then we'll probably build some sort of sheet metal thing to come up here and then take the place of that so that way we have our points in space and we can work around everything else. Now something that's definitely worth noting here is that we have to keep track of all of the time that we're spending on this thing. We need to add all of this up later on to find out how much we're actually going to charge for this part. So whether it's keeping your phone in your pocket with a timer on it on each segment that you work on or just, you know, punching in, punching out mentally or drawing some ticks on the table, it doesn't really matter what it is, just make sure that you're keeping track of time. Okay. Now that we have this in place, we're not going to use any hardware to hold it down or anything like that. We're going to build some spacers where it can just kind of set on. We don't need to fasten it down or anything else like that. What we do need to do is get the uh, center location of this bushing. But you notice carefully as we're looking closely, it is broken. That means it no worky and we have to figure out where this is going to sit on the car. Additionally, we also have a giant hole going through this mount here, which is not the same size as the hardware that's on there. So we need to figure out where this is actually going to be at, center it all up and then build some brackets to go over it. Best way to do that, tape measure. If I get the diameter of this, which is roughly three and a half inches, I know where the exact center of that hole is gonna be and we're gonna drill that hole to the same size as the hardware that's on the car. I'm also gonna go here and say I need a piece about, I don't know, two inches tall and then oh well, that other one that's like three and a half-ish and then we'll bridge the gap and go over in between somewhere in there. We'll just cut some scraps and then put all this together, you'll see. Hi, future Justin here. Uh, that design's not gonna work. The problem is, is we end up with what's called a mechanical lock, which means that the part's not going to come out of the fixture when there's metal on top of it. So obviously I had to redo it, starting with cutting the old mount completely off. Then I measured the complete height of the factory mount as it sits in the fixture, and with that dimension in hand, I ran to the shear and cut a single piece instead of three. Then I marked the center from the top, drilled it out to the proper 10 millimeter bolt hole size, and then rounded the corners out so that way, you know, it doesn't snag anything like my arm or anything else like that. Just nice little things you can do like this. I did randomly just kind of tack weld it in place, nothing fancy, made sure it was square, obviously, with the part that I was working on. That's kind of an important thing. And then I ran over to the saw to cut out a spacer. Literally just finished the cut and then the friggin' blade snapped. <laughs> We're gonna need a new one of those things. The spacer was then bored out in the lathe so that way I could slide a nut into it and weld that in place. Now it is important here to note that the height of the bushing mount is exactly center as if it would be if this bushing wasn't wasted and the hole was actually properly sized to the bolt. All right, so with that crisis averted, let's cut up some spacers for this thing and then we can start designing everything. All right, let's see what we got on the old metal rack. 
Well, we're going to use inch and a quarter for the actual cross member itself. So actually this will probably work out really well for spacers. Let's just use that one. That should fit in there. Definitely fit over here. So the bandsaw is obviously broken. So we're going to have to go old school and cut this with a grinder. So just take a little bit off the top here to bring it down to a usable size. So in order to get this angle cut just right, I'm just gonna scribe it here. And you can kind of see where that line is right there. So this tells me that this section basically here where it's marked out is face up when I make the cut along here. And hopefully we'll get close. Okay, so I'm just gonna set the angles up so that they made up with the surface underneath. It's a little bit hard to see, but and it seems kind of, I don't know, janky is a good word for it, but as long as all surfaces are mated or whatever and we just freeze it in place with the old squirt gun here, we should be good. Also worth noting, this is a temporary fixture. It is not a permanent one. All we need it to do is hold everything in place where it's supposed to be. There we go. Now it may not look like it, but this is exactly the negative version of this. So now all we gotta do, take some measurements of that, fill in the blanks. Design is kind of a tough thing to explain. The thing is, there's almost an infinite number of ways to design a product, whether it be strictly for function or with focus more toward the aesthetics or maybe even a combination of both. In order to get that design, you'll first need to grab some measurements from your fixture and even the factory part that you are basing the new part on. When it comes to measuring the fixture, you should definitely try to be as accurate as possible. Every little detail, like the distances from the datum point or the base of the part, to the distances between the mounting points, to heights and angles and so on, all need to be documented. Now I tend to scribble the dimensions down on the fixture itself and take a picture of them so I can reference them easily during drafting. I also like to outline the part as I'm going along so that way I can figure out what kind of space I have to work with. Now here's the important stuff. Three things you need to embrace when it comes to designing a part. The first thing is time. You should never feel rushed to make something work. When you feel rushed, you tend to make stupid mistakes that often result in either a part that fails or a part that doesn't sell because it has virtually no appeal to it. Now, even though the part may be under a car and hardly seen, it should look appealing to the buyer and you should take your time to come up with an appealing design for it. The second thing is what a lot of people these days call inspiration, which is kind of a fancy way of saying, I'm copying that product because I'm too lazy to make my own design. Trust me when I tell you that that will backfire on you. Maybe you'll get a couple of sales from undercutting what looks like the exact same part sold by your closest competition, but you're never going to actually get ahead with your product line if you have to wait for your closest competition to design your next part. Finally, the third thing you need to embrace is technology. Now, I hate to break it to you, but we're way past the days of graph paper, slide rules, protractors, and engineers drafting sets. There's nothing really wrong with a drawing a quick sketch out on paper, but a quick sketch is all it should be. The reason why is you have to consider what happens when you have to change the design in your engineering phase. If you spent hours drafting it all out on paper, now you gotta grab that big fat pink eraser and redo it, which is extremely time consuming. Not to mention here, the machines themselves don't speak paper. They speak code, which is derived from digital files. Now, there are tons of resources available out there, many of them completely free, that will help you cross over into the digital design world where you will be able to speak that language needed to produce these parts and products efficiently. 
Embracing technology and learning to speak that language also means that you do not have to limit your design to your current tooling. In other words, if you don't have a fast cut like I do, or maybe you don't have the saws that I do, or half the tables or other tooling and machines and equipment that I do, you can easily send this off to a number of online companies to cut parts out and mail them directly to you with only a few clicks of a button. I mean, these days you can literally build almost anything with a grinder, a welder, and a computer. Now, my design is a combination of clean and simple. I'd like it to be made primarily out of chromoly tube, and I want to keep it clean looking with almost a minimalistic approach to it. Some things like additional weight savings will come from trimming a little fat on the brackets while respecting the round shape of the tubes instead of just cutting straight angles or straight cut angles. I also want to keep the toe hook in the part since there is one on the factory part. And since the product is built by me, I need to brand it with my own signature TFS letter since the fabrication series is a really long brand tag to add to this part. Now this is my design here, all drafted up and it only took about 45 minutes to get it done. Now we can snatch off the files straight from the part and jump onto the fast cut. This is all scrap metal. Quarter inch, 3 sixteenths, eighth inch. These are the three different thicknesses that we have here. Already got everything programmed. This is nothing more than scrap metal. We should blast right on through this. Make sure that that fits. We should be good. Let's go. Nice. That is friggin' clean. I love it. Okay, time to start some bending. This piece is a test tube, if you will. I made sure that my mark out and my measurements were good. My measurements came from my drawing. They told me exactly where the bends need to be in certain lengths and, and what degree of each bend we're working with here. So I just pulled that information directly off of the drawing. Super simple, and again, that's why we use CAD. I know the full length of my tube. I did overcut it just a little bit because I wanna make sure that I have some room to trim and fit up and then make slight adjustments if I need to. The bender of choice, Rogue Fabrication Model 600. Yes, it's the same bender that I had several years ago. It's the same one that I kept and when I sold the JD Squared. Not really for any particular reason other than the accuracy of the Rogue is extremely accurate because it works off of a clamp block system. That clamp block system places the tube in a certain dimension or a certain place away from exactly where the bend is uh, supposed to start. So it just takes a few minutes to measure all this stuff out. Got all my measurements here. All we gotta do is lay them down so that way we know where we're gonna throw this into the bender and where to put these clamp blocks at. I'm not gonna get too carried away with what the actual dimensions are because it's not really relevant to this video. But I will say that I am using a marker here to get the most accurate dimensions possible. I use the marker and then I use a scribe, this little tungsten scribe right here. Gives me exactly what I need. Now with my test tube here, I actually found out that I need another two inches of offset to get it exactly where I want. And also with this test tube, I was able to calculate how much I need to bend each angle to achieve my desired angle. The thing is when you flip this over in the, uh, in the Rogue Fab, you create, uh, or at least in an S bend, you're technically unbending the other bend. And this is technically an S bend, so we have to over bend one in order to uh, bend the other one back the other way. So it, that way when it unbends to make the second bend, that means that it comes out to the desired angle. It takes a little bit of practice. The other really nice thing about using a clamp block system is that you can always clock or move each one. If you had a, a, an angular piece or something like that, you could be able to clock and rotate at a specific uh, degree or angle. But since this S bend is on the same plane, that means that they both stay completely flat when we set the clamp blocks up. It makes your layout a lot faster. And of course, as I mentioned before, the accuracy is dramatically improved. All right, this is bend number one right here. This is gonna be set to 35 degrees. 
preload this just a little bit. Pretty much when this stops spinning or it becomes tight, then we're good. Set my needle at zero. This one I'm gonna bend to 35. Actually, it's gonna be 37 and a half for spring back. Maybe it's 36 and a half. We'll figure it out. Now we'll just zip zap this one off of here. Now we throw it back in, and this time it's going in upside down, which means that we're gonna work off of the four and a half inch center line radius, and this creates a different offset, which is why I calculated all that out earlier. This is a little bit weird to do it this way, but like I said, you take the time, you figure out how it goes, and then work from there. Now this one's gonna be bent to 30 degrees. Ta-da! Not a bad looking deal right there. I'll take it. Now we'll run over to our fixture and see if this one actually fits or not. Okay, a couple things here. These are the obviously the pieces that we finished welding earlier. Uh, each one of them does have a little bit of a slot for some movement. This is for extra play in the actual chassis itself. It's been designed like this to have just a little bit extra movement. This piece here is a bushing housing. I went and uh, just cut this off at the saw real quick. It is a two inch, uh, what is it, quarter wall uh, DOM, I think it is. Uh, it's, it's a universal size for universal bushing. So, but we're not gonna obviously weld it or tack anything up or mock it up with the actual uh, bushings themselves in here because they're polyurethane. So on the other side of this washer, which you guys can't see right now, I do have a dummy bushing that I machined many, many years ago. I think we'll just set that copper there on the top so it can sit kind of freely. Now, one thing I took away from my drawing is making sure that I had common sizes when I was uh, working with things. So the bottom of the tube, the distance from the bottom of the tube to the actual fixture itself is exactly an inch. So this is a copper chill bar. This is actually from the Wild Metals Online, actually, but it makes for a great spacer. It's a one, two, three block or a three, two, one block, whichever one you want to call them. I also mounted the position on here, which would take a measurement from my drawing of where I want my vertical to take off and attach to the actual bushing housing itself here. So that's marked out on my tube. If I place this on here and I get that alignment of where the mark is to the edge of the actual uh, bushing housing right there, then I'll put this flat and clock it. And then I can take my marker here and mark out the angles and the positions in which I need to cut these. So I'm actually gonna mark out the front one first and we'll go cut this off at the correct angle making sure here that this line that i put for the reference of which side is up we got to make sure that this is correct so that way that angle is correct so this has to be facing up in order for this to be the correct angle and of course since my small bandsaw is busted we got to do this by hand I'd say that looks pretty dang good right there. I can be happy with that. So now we move over to the back side. We're still in alignment here with our bushing, which is good. That's what we want. I want to be relatively straight with this, or at least as straight as I can be. And then we'll mark out the back side, which is probably about right there. So probably the most important part on this one is that we're just gonna throw down a few tack welds. We're not gonna throw down like full on welds or anything else like that because we still haven't verified that this part actually fits on the car. So I'm gonna get at least, ooh, probably about three points on here. I've already done this off camera, got it centered up perfect where I wanted it. Everything's looking good. So I don't wanna mess anything up. So we're just gonna go right into it. And hopefully the uh, gas doesn't get blown away by my swamp cooler. Because I realize now, I just left it on. Again, nice small tacks. Mm -hmm. 
verify my alignment again. Check spacing, we're still in the middle. Looks like we're in alignment. And another three tacks. So this is still centered, which is good. These are still centered, which is good. Doesn't look too distorted, which is great. Well, if this bushing wasn't in my way, I could show you that we're off to a great start. So let's just cut this section here, then we can unbolt it and see how it fits on the car. So I actually get asked quite often if I still notch tubes without a tube notcher. You bet, I do it all the time. I do have a tube notcher. Rogue Fab was uh, kind enough to send one out to me years ago, and I have used it, and I like it, but I still do it by hand. I mean, I've been doing it for so long that way that, well, it just doesn't make sense to set something up and you know, all that other good stuff when I can just run over here and cut it out really fast. Okay, yeah, that's about as tight as I'm going to get it. So again, just quick tacks, nothing serious. Again, we want to try to maintain three points with a tack weld on them, just so it doesn't move. Distortion can be a real pain in the butt. Okay, here comes the moment of truth. The suspense. All right. Well, now we're just gonna go see if it fits on the car. There's a couple of reasons why this video was never really finished and they're kind of go hand in hand. Uh, the biggest thing is time. I run three businesses now, unlike before, and you know, it's very demanding. It takes a lot of my time. So in order to get the content produced, I have to figure out how to do it quicker, right? And in this case, it was testing out a camera guy or somebody to tail me around with it. So that way I don't have to reset all of my shots like I normally do, and I can get things done a lot quicker so that way you guys can see it. Plus it offers kind of like an immersive style. The problem there is I asked a friend of mine to help me out, and it's not his fault that the footage in the beginning there kind of looks the way that it does. He's a professional mechanic, not a professional videographer. He kind of did it as a favor to me. So, you know, it was, you, you get what you get. About halfway through that video, he had to go back to you know his work, and uh, I had to figure out how I was gonna kind of duplicate that shot. Mind you, this is a, 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 a first of the series type of video that I was gonna do. And the series was uh, uh, called DEETS, Design, Engineer, Test, and Sell, or DEETS, short for details. The whole idea was to show you guys how to build a part and effectively, you know, engineer it and, you know, test all of it, collect some data on it and then sell that part, teach you guys how to run that, you know, that kind of side hustle, which is, you know, where I got started in the industry when I became a manufacturer instead of just a fabricator slash car builder. That's really where my career took off. And for you guys that are like, you know, needing some extra cash, or whatever cases, this series could be very, very helpful. Plus it gets me back to building stuff. So with all of that, by the time I got you know, into the second half of that video without a videographer, it took a ton of time for me to do, but in order to make it look like the first half of the video, I had to fake most of the other shots. So like the camera over here, it's on a tripod, but right now it looks like somebody's kind of holding it. <laughs> it's just me in here. <laughs> But by the time I got to the point where it's at right now, uh, I had test fitted it to the car. It does fit. Uh, I could have welded it out and everything would be just fine. But as it sits right now, it looks exactly the same as it did on the car. It's just got a lot more rust on it. So um, the reason why I had to shut that down effectively, or at least not finish that video or even launch that series is because the timing of everything, we were just about ready to get into the summer of welding event that I did last year, which is where I brought my in-person classes here in Vegas at my shop. I brought them back just just for the summer. And since that whole event basically sold out in like two and a half, three weeks, you know, I was, I was committed to it. There was, there was no other way that I could, you know, shuffle the shop around for the weekend and then shuffle it back for everything else and then still do the other jobs that I have to do 
to run my company. Um, once that was all said and done, once the summer of welding event had wrapped up, we basically knew that we needed to expand. We had to make that next expansion to our our business, to Weld Metals Online, and uh, also to WeldCoach.com, which is where we teach welding right now. So I lost my my ability to work in here. I lost my space to work in here. So. It was one of those things that we just, we had to do. The idea of bringing it back to my garage, you know, that's entirely possible except for my garage is small and there's no space for like my car, my dirt bikes, all the rest of that stuff that I have in there, you know? Uh, so this summer I plan to move into, a, hopefully move into a larger, or a house with a larger garage that I can still manage all of this stuff with. But, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Now this whole series uh, that I'm working on right here uh, with the lost footage, I, I really hope you guys enjoy it. And, uh, you know, if you want to drop me a you know, comment down below, you know, just let me know how, how it goes or if you have some ideas for some other stuff when I am able to get the space and you know, start producing content. If you want welding content, uh, if you haven't noticed or figured it out by now, I shifted all of the welding education style content over to Weld Coach, the YouTube channel. That's the set that's behind me. Uh, that doesn't require a lot of space for me to work in. So I do try to regularly produce welding content over on the Weld Coach YouTube channel. I'll, I'll have it linked below. But yeah, I mean, if there's something that you want to see or if you like this episode or absolutely hated it, whatever. I mean, it's cool. Uh, you know, I can take it. Just drop it down in the comments there and, you know, let me know how it goes. But as always, that's all I got for this episode. I really do appreciate you guys sticking around and uh, kind of being patient here as, uh, as we continue to figure out what we're doing over here, I guess, or how we're going to do it. So, you know, I, uh, as always, you know, I mean, this, this, this channel couldn't have been or none of this stuff could be, you know, done without you guys. And it just it literally means the world to me. So I'll see you on the next round. Thank you so much.